Hello again. Uh, welcome back to my course, History of Socialism. Today we continue our conversation about uh, the socialist experiences uh, beyond Europe. Okay. Last time we talked about uh, African socialism. Today I'm going to take you to the Middle East. And the topic uh, of our conversation today is so-called kibbutz socialism in Israel. It's a story about volunteer Jewish settlements that had been set up in uh, Palestine as early as 1910 and continued until 1970s, 1980s. And what can we make about this experience? What kind of um, socialism did they come up with in this part of the world? And why in the first place? this kibbutz socialism emerge okay so let me take you first take you back to let's say the years of 1947-1948 if you studied history world history you remember that 1947 the state of israel 1947 1948 the state of israel was set up by the united nations a project that was initiated by the great powers in the wake of the second world war when uh, jewish population of europe was targeted by national socialists for annihilation the holocaust genocide which was unleashed by the Nazi during the Second World War. Okay, at first, as we learned in our lecture on National Socialism, Jews were segregated, they were taken away all their rights, they were ostracized, they were forced into emigration, and those who remained were abused, they were forbidden to occupy certain positions, they were forbidden to get married to Germans and eventually when World War II brought the violence and the violence escalated they became uh, targets of uh, anti-Jewish policies of the Nazis so along with the Poles some Slavic people and Jews were targeted for genocide and the place where this uh, genocide took place was uh, you know, Western Belarus, Western Ukraine, and especially Poland. That's where the major, the uh, the larger number of so-called extermination concentration camps were located. But why why am I telling you this? Because I want to give you the context. So we know this uh, number that six million Jews were killed during the Second World War as a result of this Holocaust. And before actually Holocaust started, in Europe in general, there was, um, not only in Germany, but in Poland, in Romania, in Bulgaria, in Hungary, there was very much a rise of anti-Semitism. And I'm going to emphasize this again. So there was, um, to make a point, there was... Um, desire on the part of many Jews of Europe who couldn't find the room in Europe because they were ostracized. There were no room for them in these uh, newly emerging nationalisms which sprang up in Europe in the wake of the First World War. Okay, So thousands of Jews decided to leave because there was no room for them. And the place for them to go was Palestine. Okay, In 1947, as a uh, reimbursement as an act of reimbursement on the part of great powers so Jews were granted their own independent state and ironically ironically the Soviet Union was the major supporter of this idea Stalin hoped that by creating the state of Israel and populating uh, the state of Israel by thousands of Jews uh, Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who liked socialist ideas he thought it would be a fortress against england against the english presence so that's how he thought about it 
So America, United States were ambivalent about this, but eventually United States supported this project because um, the Jewish community in the United States was and is very powerful. Okay, so it was um, very influential, and the U.S. government was swayed into supporting this initiative, and eventually England also supported it. But ironically. Uh, contrary to Stalin's expectations, um, <clears throat> eventually a new Jewish population sided with the United States and eventually decided to ally themselves with the West instead of the Soviet Union. Even though, I repeat, and we're going to talk about it, many Jews who moved from Eastern Europe, they did sympathize with socialism because that's what our conversation is all about. Okay, So... <clears throat> In this area, you can see these areas colored in um, <clears throat> colored in yellow. That's where the Jewish state was established. Even before 1947, a Jewish settlers started to set up in Palestine. That was the name of this area. Both Arabs and uh, Jews lived there together, and the name of the place was Palestine. Okay. Um, in 1920s, 1930s, a lot of new Jewish immigrants who came here, they set up agricultural settlements. Dozens of them, then hundreds of them. By the end of 1970s, there were hundreds of these agricultural settlements. And these agricultural settlements were based on socialist ideas. Socialist ideas. So they preached socialism. Labor on the land, socialism, and many of them were located in borderland areas, right here in borderland areas. It's very important to emphasize in borderland areas. In the most unfavorable, many of these settlements were located in the most unfavorable from agricultural viewpoint environment. So purposely. Many settlers moved there to fight the nature, to set up settlements, to prove to themselves and to the rest of the world they can build these socialist settlements. Okay. Basically, what these um, settlements, kibbutz, kibbutz, it's, um, again, let me explain to you. Kibbutz, it's a single, so one agricultural settlement. It means... A kibbutz, an uh, agricultural settlement where there is no private property, a land belongs to everybody, people share everything, people are not paid, they eat together, they sleep together, they work together. So it's a communist type settlement. Kibbutzim, kibbutzim, it's a plural. It's in Hebrew. Plural, okay. Kibbutz, one agricultural settlement. Kibbutzim, many agricultural settlements. Just for you. To make, to make sure that you remember what we're talking about. So, we are talking about military agricultural Jewish settlements that were set up in Palestine between 1920s and the 1970s. Although there were a few socialist settlements that had been set up before the 1920s, a few. The goal was to colonize the Palestine territory. Okay. Ironically, only 5% of the Israeli population lived in these settlements by the 1970s. So the majority of people did not live in these kibbutz settlements. But at the same time, these agricultural settlements, they were very important. First, they protected the borders of this newly emerging state as early as 1920s, before the state of Israel was established. They already... Had, they had been set up there to protect the, the borders of ethnic Jewish territory. Okay. And the second, these kibbutzim settlements gave rise to the Israeli military and political elite, elite. The first major political leaders of the Israeli state, they came from these areas. Take, for example, Moshe Dayan, this famous Israeli secretary of defense who was... Um, presiding over the Israeli military during these Arab-Israeli wars, 1948, 1967, 
1973, there were three wars, major wars of uh, of the state of Israel against the Arab neighbors. And during these three wars, this um, military man, Moshe Dayan, was in charge. So he came from this one of these agricultural settlements. In fact, he came from the first agricultural settlements, socialist agricultural settlements that had been set up in Israel. The name of this settlement was Digania, Digania, and I'm going to talk about it. The first uh, agricultural settlements based on socialist ideas. It had been set up in 1910. Okay, 1910. So this future Secretary of Defense of Israel was born there. The one of the major ideologists of uh, Zionism. Zionism is Jewish nationalism. If you don't know what it means, Aaron Gordon, one of the major ideologists of Zionism, was born in the kibbutz, in the same settlement, the first kibbutz named Digani. So, in many, many other leaders. For example, Prime Minister of Israel, a woman named uh, Golda Meirson or Golda Meir, who was in power for a long time. She also was born in one of the kibbutz. She lived for a long time in one of the kibbutz. Okay. So, Despite their demographic, minuscule demographic presence, their social, political, ideological role was very important. Okay. People who represented kibbutz and their socialist ideas mixed with the dose of nationalism were in power in Israel as late as the 1970s. Only in the 1977 Socialist ideas started to lose their popularity in Israel. So, until 1977, so-called <coughs> Israeli Labour Party was in power. Okay. It was a loose socialist organization that united a lot of trade unions, some um, non-Marxist socialist groups, and some Marxist groups also sided with the Labour Party. Although there was a separate communist party in Israel as well. But anyway, it was like a big umbrella um, organization called the Labour Party. That from the very beginning to 1977 was in power. Okay. And many leaders of this power, they also came from kibbutz areas. I would like to draw your attention to two sources that gave rise to these agricultural settlements. To the whole project of the agricultural settlements. First, of course, it's the idea of Jewish nationalism, Zionism. Okay. When Jews for the first time felt insecure in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, at first in Eastern Europe, then in Central Europe in 1920s, 1930s. So that's what created this backlash on their part, a desire to create their own state and to move away from the Europeans who didn't want to accept them. Okay, that's how the idea of Zionism emerged in the first place. You know that Zionism <clears throat> emerged in the 1880s, 1890s in Eastern Europe, in Eastern and Central Europe, and it was um, it had been launched by um, an Austrian journalist of Jewish origin named. Theodor Herzl, who wrote a famous book, The Jewish State. I'm going to talk more about it. Okay. So Theodor Herzl, the book, uh, The Jewish State. So where he, in a very accessible form, articulated the ideas of Zionism by, by uh, telling his fellow tribesmen, tribeswomen, that we need to go to, back to Palestine because there's no room for us in Europe. We constantly, no matter what we do, we constantly harassed. We have to find a place, a safe place. <coughs> Pardon my current jargon. <clears throat> anyway, um, and the second idea, which is frequently neglected, it was socialism. Because ideas of socialism, socialism was very popular among the, in the Jewish community. We talked about it a lot. Okay? Because for many 
uh, Jews. Socialism was a way to fight against anti-Semitism. And originally, remember, in socialism, there was this grand idea that since uh, socialism downplays ethnic nationalism, uh, uh, preaches cosmopolit cosmopolitan ideas, internationalism, so like Marx said in the Communist Manifesto, um, workers have no motherland. Workers of all countries unite. So he, he tries he, he tried to downplay the ethnic differences, this naive expectation of Marx and the originally Moses Hess, remember the friend of Marx, uh, who preached the same philosophy that socialism and communism would help us to mute and to phase out anti-Semitism because all toiling people of the world, they will get united, the ethnic borders would disappear, and since we're people of labor, we will be friends, brothers and sisters, and we will march toward the utopian um, communist paradise. But in the reality, of course, it didn't happen. Nationalism, uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> turned out to be more powerful than ideas of socialism and all these socialist ideas they eventually mutated into nationalism or mixed with socialism so in this case um those jews who preached socialism they were not an exception to this general rule and some of them uh, <clears throat> except the most committed ones the communists who still continued to believe in the internationalist paradise no matter what people like trotsky luxembourg remember we mentioned this the great cosmopolitan dreamers okay who believed blindly in this internationalist communist paradise but for many jews who still continued socialist jews who still continued to experience anti-semitism on the ground in eastern europe western europe um to mix their socialism with ideas of Zionism became a good, safe outlet. Okay, that's what exactly happened. For many Jews, that's what it was. At the turn of the 19th century, uh, on the ground, in their practical application, so how they became, how they behaved, how they thought, uh, a bit of socialism, a bit of Zionism became the major... Mind, the, represent the major mindset okay so for many P jews who migrated to palestine and those who remained in eastern europe or central europe this mixture of socialism and zionism became the the major mainstream orientation ideological orientation okay and uh, remember for the first time the ideas of this um, nationalist socialism let me put it this way war had been articulated by Moses Hess, who became frustrated about internationalism because despite him preaching ideas of brotherhood, working class brotherhood, he realized that in Germany, Jews still did not feel secure. And that is why as early as, 19, as, early as 1861, in his book, Rome and Jerusalem, Moses Hess began to preach what? Uh, return of Jews to Palestine. But what kind of return? Not simply return for the sake of return, but you need to go there to Palestine and set up socialist settlements. That's what Moses Hess had argued as early as 19... Uh, I'm sorry, as early as 1861 in his book. Okay, so uh, we need to settle in Palestine away from these anti-Semites of Europe and we're going to establish a socialist state in Israel and we will show to the rest of the world because we're chosen people, we will show the rest of the world how we can set up a, social, a socialist paradise <laughs> down there. Right? It's so interesting, this mix of biblical and secular uh, prophecy, right? <clears throat> A bit of history for you. To be exact, the first agricultural settlements had been set up in um, Palestine in the 1880s, 1890s. But these settlements, they did not exactly preach socialist ideas. In fact, I have to correct myself. Many people who joined these settlements, these projects, they did sympathize with um, ideas of socialism. Who were these people? 
who moved to Palestine, hundreds of people, not many, who Jews who escaped from primarily from the Russian Empire. Because Poland before was part of the Russian Empire, Ukraine, Belarus, that's where they came from, the, the coast of Black Sea. So they escaped to Palestine, set up settlements. Many of these Jews, they sympathized with ideas of populism. Remember who Russian populists were? These were the folk who preached peasant socialism, socialism of the land, peasant commune, working together, collective, labor on the land. Okay. Unfortunately, <clears throat> many Jews who joined this Russian populist movement, they experienced by 1890s this, I would say, cognitive, cognitive dissonance because uh, some of these so-called common people, peasants or margin, this redneck peasants or redneck workers in uh, southern Russian cities, they were prone to anti-Semitic propaganda as well. And um, in the 1880s, 1890s, in southern Russian cities, Crimea, Odessa, it's a coast of Black, uh, Black, sea Co Black Sea Coast, and Ukraine, there was a, there was a series of pogroms against Jews okay so local officials instigated this uh, underclass elements Russian underclass elements in southern Russia and Ukraine to crusade against the Jews because Jews were blamed in uh, socialist propaganda and especially this type of um, "Quote unquote crusade against the Jews gained momentum after Alexander the Second Russian Tsar was assassinated. 1883, Russian Tsar Alexander the Second was assassinated, and the group of revolutionaries who belonged to this." these assassins who are Russians and Jews Russians and Jews in fact Jews were minority there mostly it was Russians but still the the uh, disproportional presence of Jews gave these um, local officials an excellent excuse to blame Jews in being these um, proponents of the socialist ideas so pogroms to make a long story short there's uh, the books about pogroms it's a lot the story um, has been told in many details if you're interested you can go on internet google it and plenty of information to make a long story short in uh, there were dozens of pogroms against the jews and by the way not only against jews but also against the greeks because there were greek merchants in southern russian cities and since jews they were um, mostly concentrated um, in um, merchant professions, dentistry, pharmacy, okay, restaurant ownership, so all these uh, professions, they became a target for these underclass elements. The Jewish businesses were rooted, there were riots of these uh, so-called common people who felt that they were unfairly treated by... Uh, the Jews and uh, <clears throat> seeking for this justice, so to speak, these underclass elements raided Jewish businesses, ruined them, set them on fire, destroyed them. Hundreds of Jewish businesses in southern Russian cities were ruined. And uh, hundreds of Jews died. They were killed, bitten. Um, the central authorities in the St. Petersburg hardly did anything they just raised their hands oh we kind of we are not involved okay so jews felt unprotected amid these riots so there was nobody to protect them when hundreds of their businesses were ruined destroyed 
So what could you do in this case? Where can you go? You cannot go to a court because there's anti-Semitism against you. So the government doesn't want to send the troops to protect them. So what can you do? And of course, uh, Jews didn't have any arms to protect themselves. By the way, the pogroms became one of the reasons why Jews started to create their own militia to protect themselves. Okay, later in 1901, 1903, 1905, because pogroms continued. Again, to make a long story short, the only option was to escape, to emigrate. That's when there was a huge immigration of Jews from the Russian Empire abroad. The most Jewish immigrants, of course, went to the United States, North America. The total number of Jews who left the Russian Empire was 2 million people. 2 million people. Mostly the United States. Some of them went to South America, Argentina. Some of them went to UK. Some of them settled in France. Some of them in Canada. So 2 million. But the most committed who wanted to build socialism they went to Palestine. Plus, there was also assumption that Palestine had been our ancient land and it resonated with them. So there were not only secular Jews who belonged to the populist movement who moved away from Russia because they couldn't find... By the way, remember I mentioned cognitive, the cognitive dissonance? Some of the Jewish participants of the populist movement felt a, um, felt a tough choice because their populist comrades, by the way, both Russian and Jews, they told them, other Jewish comrades who said, we need to protect our people who are victims of pogroms. Jewish workshops, businesses ruined, people killed. But you know what responded to them? Some of their Russian comrades, members of the populist movement, and some Jews, by the way, they said, oh, it's a common people. These peasants and um, outcasts in the city, in the towns and cities who raided Jewish businesses, these are common people. They fight against Jewish bourgeoisie, against Jewish capitalists. It's a righteous indignation against oppressors. And uh, it made the many Jewish populists felt uncomfortable, very much uncomfortable. How, how can I justify it? I cannot protect my people. On the one hand, we preach this notion that peasants and some underclass Russian-Ukrainian residents, they're salt of the earth, they're great new hope. On the other hand, these people are beating and killing people who belong to my tribe. What can I do about it? Interesting, eh? Not many books write about it, but I would like to stress this because it's a very important issue what I'm mentioning right now. So, and in frustration, in desperation, a, lo a lot of Jews who were socialists became frustrated and they, they decided to escape to Palestine and build in Palestine their socialist paradise. You know what I'm talking about? So that was the goal. So they didn't want to say goodbye to the socialist ideas because socialism was on the minds of the people at that time. All, practically all intellectuals embraced this ideal, okay? But at the same time, they felt uncomfortable. They didn't want to justify, to excuse these crimes of these out, uh, underclass that organized Russian and Ukrainian underclass people who organized pogroms. They were not common people for them, although some populists argued they were common people. So just to escape the whole situation, they decided to move away. At the same time, it wasn't only secular Jews, as I said. There were also a number of religious Jews who also joined this enterprise, who said, yes, we need to go to Palestine because there was no room for us. Okay. And then what we have, we have the collapse of empires. 19th 
1917. 1918, the collapse of the Russian Empire, revolution, remember, Russian Empire collapsed and uh, in the wake of the empire, we have a bunch of independent states like Poland, an independent state that emerged uh, <clears throat> out of the rubbles of the empire, Finland, okay, <clears throat> Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed and we have a bunch of new states emerging on, again out of the rubbles of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and these new states were Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Austria, all these new states, see, and each new state started to what? To massage, to massage each, uh, its own nationalism, okay? Like in Poland, for instance, in Austria, in Czechoslovakia, in Romania. So, uh, they switched to their indigenous languages. They started to invent their histories, glorifying their nations. So, in the Jews, there was not much room for Jews in this situation. And you, you know that newly emerging nationalisms, they are very aggressive. Okay. That is why Jews felt very uncomfortable about it. That is why many Jews felt well, uh, felt so many, uh, so much sympathy for the Soviet Union because early Soviet Union, uh, remember when early Bolsheviks were in power, they preached internationalism, cosmopolitanism, so all um, workers are brothers and sisters and we're going to build across the globe the union of the social... Uh, Soviet Socialist Republics, okay? Again, the message was that the Soviet Union was expected to become an internationalist cosmopolitan state where there would be no room for nationalism, okay? So that is why Eastern European Jews liked the Soviet Union. That is why many of them actually went to work for the Soviet bureaucracy, for the Soviet military intelligence, services and so forth and so forth but again we are more interested in the, uh, these agricultural settlements the kibbutzim experience okay so when we have these newly emerging nationalisms in the wake of the first world war uh, jews thousands of jews started to move away from europe to palestine okay and of course when german national socialism comes to power when anti-semitism became the official doctrine of the German regime, we have even more immigrants going to Palestine, okay? I would also like to mention that um, in uh, the 1920s, when the Stalinist regime was not yet, was not yet fully established, in this uh, cosmopolitan paradise uh, created by early Bolsheviks, paradise, of course, in quotation marks, there were some room for Jews um, to publish their books in Yiddish. Yiddish is a popular language, language of Jewish grassroots, in contrast to Hebrew, which became the official ancient quote-unquote language of Israel. So Yiddish it was the language spoken by Eastern European Jews, a popular language. Um, there were books, magazines published in this language. Jewish schools were created and Jewish collective farms. Okay. Before the mass collectivization, 1929, there were some volunteer groups of Jews who sympathized with the Bolshevik project, who set up Jewish agricultural settlements, particularly particular in southern Russia. What? Why did they do it? Again, here is the important point. The point was to re-educate Jews from capitalism and instill into them the ideals of socialism. See, that was the major message of these agricultural settlements because the assumption was among these Jewish activists that many of us were involved in so-called Jewish professions like pharmacy, dentistry, uh, merchandise, uh, trade, okay? 
intellectual professions we forgot we forgot um, how to work on the land we destroyed the links to the soil so we forgot how to do manual labor so for many people who set up these collective farms and later who became the spearheads of uh, kibbutzim in Palestine work on the land almost became like a religion ideological mantra so you have to go back to the land to the land and to be reunited with the land to establish these links with the land and another thing you have to work together on the land so collective labor on the land would help to rejuvenate the soul of the jewish people okay who were again that's what jewish ideologists said at that time who preached both socialism and zionism by the way zionism did never in early early zionism did not exist in this pure form it was practically always mixed with socialism so um uh, the message of this um, nationalist socialism was that jews had been corrupted by their lifestyle by being involved in this capitalistic professions and they have to redeem themselves by going back to the land working on the land okay so originally these agricultural settlements were some of them were established in palestine some of them were established in southern russia in 1920s okay but for the whole idea to be complete they had to go back home so that's what many of these um, ideologists of uh, jewish socialism argued so we, we cannot yes it's okay we can set up uh, settlements socialist settlements um, collective farms in southern russia but still it's not our soil we, we we don't know what to expect because tomorrow we might be attacked and we might be destroyed so we need to find a place where we can build our jewish socialism in a safe environment and the only safe environment was palestine so hence the message so we need to be reunited with our indigenous land in order to build socialism there see interesting the soil blood soil and socialism getting together okay <clears throat> so the idea was to set up these agricultural settlements and to root jews in their own native soil so it's a it's practically each nationalism preaches there if you go to german nationalism russian nationalism except american nationalism because american nationalism you know is based on the constitution that's what makes it unique but if you go to any other nationalism in europe and other countries it uh, it uh, frequently emphasizes this uh, the value of native soil indigenous soil so that the uh, jews were not exception an exception in this case were not an exception in this case and they preached the same thing um the only difference that since they were dispersed all over the world <clears throat> and particularly we're talking about europe where they experienced uh, a lot of anti-semitism they said that we need to go back home to get reunited with our native soil okay we in the, the best way to get reunited with our native soil to set up self-governing agricultural communities and what may what might make our experience better i would like to emphasize we need to choose the most unfavorable sites the, i want to emphasize this the most unfavorable sites for these agricultural settlements to show to ourselves and to the rest of the people that we can through collective labor we can redeem ourselves that is why ironically we face this interesting situation when the 1920s 1930s when uh, these um, jewish immigrants instilled with ideas of socialism many of them i repeat like 80 percent of them were instilled with ideals of socialism moving to palestine they actually requested requested to be settled in the most unfavorable areas deserts swamps 
okay because they wanted to prove to themselves and to surrounding people that they can build rebuild this land they can man manually work okay we are not mer merchants we are not pharmacists we are not dentists in fact former people who uh, had been occupied in these professions they intentionally or students people intellectual profession intentionally started to switch to manual occupations in order to prove themselves okay and of course coming to palestine created this uh, hazardous situation when uh, jews started to experience the hostility of local arabs i would like to emphasize that in 1920s 1930s jews did not take away arabic lands no no i researched this issue because i would like to explore i wanted to explore this all the lands that were designated by so-called jewish national fund again there was a special jewish national fund that was sponsored by a rich rich jewish uh, philanthropist interesting ironically uh, a jewish capitalist sponsored jewish socialism in palestine that's irony of this situation right but anyway um a jewish national fund uh, that owned this land so the land was not privately owned by the jews okay and these agricultural settlements kibbutz they didn't own the land the land was held by a kibbutz but not owned by a kibbutz the land belonged to jewish national fund okay as a collective property of an ethnic jewish community and what they did they uh, picked up lands that were neglected by absentee Arabic lords in Palestine and purchased these lands. The lands were purchased and given to agricultural settlements. That's how it was done. The lands were purchased. They were not taken away from the Arabs. Okay. But since many more and more thousands of Jews were coming, so local Arabs still felt uh, threatened by this influx of... Uh, colonizers that's how they viewed them okay and that's what started clashes in fact arabs uh, frequently attacked these uh, people who lived in kibbutz areas shot them destroyed their fields okay for example the first socialist settlement kibbutz named named digania set up in 1910 was attacked by the Arabs and uh, those Jews who worked in the field they were shot in the back and some of them were killed at effects okay so Jews started to create uh, self-defense groups to guard themselves against uh, uh, Arabs who raided their settlements so that was the that's how the situation was developed on the ground and in fact there were a lot of uh, there were bloody clashes between Jews and um, Arabs not only in these frontier areas where agricultural settlements were set up but also in other parts of Israel for example in Jerusalem there was a bloody fight in 1929 uh, not far from the uh, how it's called uh, the, the, the the wall the sacred wall I'm sorry <clears throat> the sacred wall in Jerusalem where Jews pray so there was a big um, a bloody fight between Arab mobs and uh, Jewish people who went to pray there. <clears throat> okay. So an average kibbutzim was a community of like-minded people who belonged to different socialist groups. I want to emphasize that they didn't belong to a particular group like Marxian socialism. No, there were a bunch of different groups because they were volunteer groups. There were hundreds of, I repeat, there were hundreds of kibbutz, kibbutzim. And um, each kibbutzim developed its own um, guidelines where they specified what kind of ideology they would have, what kind of rules they would have. So there were actually some uh, Marxist kibbutz. There were some non-Marxist kibbutz. There were some kibbutzim that were set up on these populist ideas, which I mentioned. The ideas 
of peasant socialism. Only the difference is that we don't want to deal with the Russian Ukrainian peasants who are very anti Semitic. We are going to become ourselves Jewish peasants. Okay, so that was the goal. So the sum of the socialists who came to settle in these kibbutzim, they thought about themselves as Jewish peasants who would create these agricultural communes, and these peasant communes would be the cradle of Jewish socialism. And of course, they um, had the ideological fights with their neighbors, like Marx and socialists, who said, no, 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 it's, uh, we have to strive, it's only temporary, transitional thing, kibbutz, eventually we have to strive to create Jewish pro proletariat, and so forth, and so forth. In fact, jumping ahead, I would like to say that uh, that there were some Marxist-Leninist kibbutzim, Marxist-Leninist, so basically Stalinist kibbutzim who had portraits of Stalin in their dining halls and uh, along with portraits of Theodor Herzl, interesting thing, eh? So which shows that uh, you cannot avoid nationalism, right? Even in, even in Marxist-Leninist kibbutzim. I researched this area, uh, portraits of Stalin, Marx and Lenin, uh, coexisted with portraits of Zionists, major Zionists, okay, which serves as another proof that it was National Socialism that was the mainstream ideological orientation for those people. I mean, Jewish National Socialism, let's put it this way, because when you say the word National Socialism, immediately we think about German National Socialist. But here again is a defensive project. We're talking about defensive Jewish prog uh, project, of course, mm. against European anti-Semitism. Although, I repeat, many on the left, many on the left today... Um, and it started in 1967 during the second Arab-Israeli war. They started to view Jewish nationalist socialism as an offensive project. Okay. So against the Arabic neighbors. That is why one of the reasons why many among the current left, they don't like the state of Israel because they believe that uh, the state is... Uh, based on ideas of this uh, national Jewish nationalism okay and and that's how they think about the current state of Israel <clears throat> basically the left argue many on the left now argue that yes originally uh, this project of uh, Israel had some defensive traits but eventually it turned into offensive project Anyway, that's what some left argue. <clears throat> I would like to emphasize another thing. Kibbutz were not profitable. It, these were not profitable projects. Okay, They were sponsored projects. Their very existence uh, was justified by the necessity to protect the borders of the emerging Jewish ethnic community. Again, it was sponsored by rich donors, sponsors, and later by Israeli government. Until 1977, um, kibbutzim were sponsored by the government. <clears throat> I mentioned that first, I already mentioned this, that the first person who actually came up with this idea that we need social settlements in Palestine was Moses Hess, one of the founding fathers, what later, remember, we called uh, Marxism, although Hess uh, broke with Marx and Engels because he became uh, a Zionist, uh, nationalist socialist, nationalist slash socialist. And Zionist, by the way, uh, they um, consider Moses Hess one of the founding heads of Zionism, okay? Theodor Herzl, who is considered also one of the icons of Zionism, a Jewish nationalist, he was not immune to socialist ideas either. Everybody knows about, practically everybody knows about his book, 
the Jewish state written in published in 1896 and I mentioned this two times but not many people know that Theodor Herzl also wrote a book called Alt Alt Neue Land Alt Neue Land which means Ancient New Land 1902 very interesting book it shows that the links of early Zionism with socialism, with socialism. This book describes the ideal utopian society. Obviously, Palestine, where people live in cooperative commonwealth, where land was owned together by these cooperative societies. And together, this small agricultural co-ops or factory co-ops or whatever co-ops so everything the, the whole economy was based on cooperative see not individualism not state socialism but cooperative socialism so to speak and these uh, Jewish cooperatives were united were to create the government and together they would set up this nationwide co-op commonwealth and they would each cooperative would send delegates to the parliament to the new jewish parliament and these jewish parliament would rule over these uh, over the commonwealth of these collectors okay something that reminds us this yugoslavian experience remember we talked about yugoslavian socialism <clears throat> essentially a group 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 property <clears throat> collectives that own everything on the ground <clears throat> another founding father <clears throat> was Dov Ber Borachov who actually said who was a socialist he was a Jewish socialist but who said yes guys nationalism is very potent very much potent you cannot beat this so we he actually sympathized with marxist socialism he was a marxist but then he said marxism downplayed ethnic and national ideas so we have to take them into consideration so what is the way for us jews to take this <clears throat> nationalism into consideration we need to go back to palestine where in a safe environment we would recreate this natural ground which other countries had for themselves okay it's like germans they lived on their german indigenous soil they have german capitalists german working class people german peasants but we jews do not have this in order for us in order for us to become a healthy nation uh, which would be of course going forward towards socialism we need that first to go back to palestine where we would recreate the these normal um conditions healthy conditions which other countries already had but we jews didn't have them yet so let's go back to palestine at some point we are going to have our own jewish workers our own jewish capitalists our own jewish peasants and that's when we are going to have our own normal class struggle and eventually of course proletariat would win and proletariat would create this ideal communist society see interesting eh? interesting scheme <clears throat> he, so he tried to fit this jewish nationalist scheme um, within the framework of marxism okay in fact um he was one of the intellectual spearheads of uh, poale poale Zion, Poale Zion, it's a political party that mixed Marxism with Zionism. Marxism with Zionism. Poale Zion is translated as Workers of Zion. A very influential political party, party, which, by the way, was in charge of creating Jewish militia, especially when the Russian Empire fell apart in 1917, where there was nobody to defend Jews, so they created armed militia to protect jewish settlements and jewish businesses okay <clears throat> but the more first and foremost message of uh, uh, wor workers of zion dov ber borachov was we need to go back to our homeland and build their socialist state 
the uh, one of the major people who actually worked, who did the work on the ground to spearhead this project of uh, collective socialist agriculture was uh, another Zionist icon, Joseph Trampeldor, a very interesting figure. He was not a theoretician, although he plugged himself into this uh, theory work, but he was more practical. Man, practical man um, he liked he actually worked to fulfill this project okay interesting figure he was a veteran of russo japanese war a secular jew who grew up in uh, southern russia in the russianized family assimilated families although he was a jew he observed a lot of Russian culture. He knew Russian language, read Russian um, writers, went to a, a Russian school. And eventually he was drafted into the army. And um, he was a very brave soldier. He was awarded one of the major orders of the Russian Empire. The Order of St. George. The Order of St. George. It's the highest military award in Russia for his combat performance. He actually ended up being a prisoner of the Japanese. And eventually he was exchanged and came back to Russia. <clears throat> a decorated veteran, so let me put it this way. So uh, um, Jews were discriminated against. They couldn't come to college before 1917. They couldn't do anything. <clears throat> all kind of restrictions, all kind of restrictions. But as a, veteran awarded with the highest award of the Russian Empire, he was accepted by the mainstream. So he was able to go to college to get uh, uh, some education. He actually got enrolled in St. Petersburg Law School. So he had like uh, three um, years of legal training. He didn't complete, but he did have three years of legal training. Um, he was drawn both to ideas of socialism so he was hooked on this populist idea that we Jews, we should um, become like peasants. We should, do, we should do more manual labor. And through manual labor, we would be redeemed. Okay? It, would, it, would, uh, make a, it would make us a healthy nation. At the same time, we are going to revive the Jewish nation. So there's a bit of socialism, a bit of Zionism. He read this Jewish state by Theodor Herzl. He goes in 1911 and settles in this Degania kibbutz, the first socialist, the first kibbutz that openly declared the socialist ideas. That is why Degania um, is called the mother of all kibbutz, because it was the first kibbutz created by 12, 12 uh, persons, 10 men and one woman, there were only 10 at first, in 1910, and they openly declared the ideas of socialism. So uh, Joseph Trampeldor joined this kibbutz and he becomes actually, um, he puts himself in charge of self-defense force to protect this kibbutz against Arab, against the local Arabs. And then the revolution happens in Russia. He goes back to Russia, of course. He was excited, and of course he was part of, partially Jew, but partially he was uh, part of Russian culture because he was raised on the Russian literature, <clears throat> partially assimilated in the Russian society. So he goes back to St. Petersburg or Petrograd, and um, he begins to recruit a Jewish people to join him to go back to Palestine to set up new Jewish settlements based on socialist ideas. In fact, he was able to recruit a large group of people, some Jewish professionals who wanted to quit their intellectual jobs, like pharmacy, whatever, former students, and some workers, actually. There were some Jewish workers who actually worked in the factories, some workshops. So he recruited a big group of people. They go to Crimea. And in this, uh, in the Crimean area, they set up a commune, agricultural commune, 1919. See, it was the time of the civil war in Russia, when the reds against the whites. But 
he set up a Jewish commune where he wanted to train Jews how to do agriculture, okay, before they moved to Palestine. So basically, this commune became like a training ground for would-be settlers, socialist settlers who planned to go back to Palestine. And then he goes to Palestine, sets up another settlement in the most unfavorable environment. Remember, I told you the one of the major requests of these um, ideologists who promote the idea of kibbutzim was let us set up settlements in the desert environment, hot environment, humid environment. Okay, so he chose he and his friends uh, chose one of these places set up a kibbutz in the close proximity to arabic settlers and there was a fight big fight in 1920 with the arabs who attacked this new settlement and with a uh, group of militia he fought back and he was shot because uh, that was a large group of arabs and he and a few other militia men like five or six of them were overwhelmed by a big group of Arabs and he was shot and killed and today of course he's a martyr of Zionism if you go to Israel you will see a big statue a monument devoted to uh, Joseph Trumpeldor okay it's a sacred icon of Zionism and lit um, present-day tour guides will hardly mention that at the same time, he shared ideas of socialism. Socialism. Okay. They only put emphasis on his Jewish nationalism. <clears throat> I would like to mention an interesting thing. We talked about kibbutzim until by now. Until now where there was no private property, where people were eating together, working together, and frequently sleeping together. Okay, They only owned clothing, pieces of clothing. And um, on many occasions, even they had communal laundries where all the clothing was put in the same pile, washed, and then simply distributed among the people, irrespective of who they were irrespective of sizes of pants, sizes of shirts, to emphasize this collective living. So we, until now we talked about these settlements, but I did mention that in addition to kibbutzim, there were few other settlements based on different ideas. Okay, And I would like to bring this second project, which I didn't mention, and we would like to explore how this project developed in the time in time and space okay in addition to kibbutz there were so-called mashav cooperative settlements remember i just told you about uh, theodore herzl the major one of the major ideologists of zionism who talked about cooperatives so in addition to kibbutz that overall dominated the settlement of Israel, kibbutz were dominating. There were mashav, where people were able to work individual plots. Again, they didn't own land as private property because land still belonged to Jewish National Fund, but where a Jewish family was able to work on a separate family plot. Okay? But at the same time, they had the right to use the same tractors, the same thrashers, that belong that uh, belong to collector okay they also uh, piled together products of their labor produce and uh, sold it in cooperative stores and then they shared and then they shared the incomes received from selling of their produce okay but working on the land was not together each family worked their own plot at the same time there was some uh, Mashav cooperative settlements, they said that um, we need to separately sell our produce, although they used machines together. Okay, there were turns, they took turns. At the same time, they also established mar um, uh, military armed militia. 
to help together as a cooperative. And uh, they also elected elected their representatives like kibbutz and the same stuff. At the same time, they were not allowed to use the hired labor. See, in kibbutzim, hired labor was forbidden, of course, because they were communistic settlements. But here, they were able to use the labor of family members. And there were some big families with a lot of labor, but they were, they were forbidden to hire labor because it would be considered exploitation. So it's, uh, see, not a communistic settlement, but still with a lot of socialistic traits, okay? <clears throat> Interesting. In 1927, and I emphasize here in my slide, World Zionist Congress stressed that Mashav, the Mashav, Mashav pattern was not effective for colonization purposes. See, interesting. It was the kibbutzim that had to become the major way to settle Palestine. See, collective settlements, working together, eating together, and fighting together. Why? Because World Zionist Congress had a clear ethno-political goal to quickly settle the Palestine land. And Mashav with their individual plots wasn't good enough. Okay, People should be mobilized. People should be collectivized like an army. And these kibbutzim perfectly fit this goal to quickly bring people together and um, make them fight and work together. See, militarized environment the environment of mobilization. That is why Kibbutzim model won at this point, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. Okay. In fact, um, what they didn't like, World Zionist Congress and uh, Zionist leaders, they didn't like that some people who worked in Moshav, who worked on their individual plots, they did hire labor. Secretly, of course. And they hired Arabic labor. But World Zionist Congress didn't want Arabs to be hired <laughs> by the uh, agricultural settlements. Why? Because it would um, dilute this um, ethnic Jewish domain. So they wanted to see these agricultural settlements as the integral part of this um, ethnic commonwealth represented by the Jews. Okay where there was no room for Arabs, okay? They talked about the dangers of individual farming, okay? Dangers of indiv individual farming. Because when you do individual farming, you might hire an Arabic labor, and that is why um, a Jewish National Fund actually forbade, forbade to hire Arabic labor. But some of these... Um, cooperative settlement members, they did occasionally, not frequently, because there was hostility between Arabs and Jews. Occasionally they did hire Arabic labor in order to completely, to completely stop this and to completely segregate uh, Jews and Arabs. <clears throat> These rules were introduced that on the land that was given to agricultural settlements, kibbutz, mashav, no Arabic labor had to be hired. And by the way, the tools of control were easy to use where? In a kibbutz, where people were keeping, a, keeping an eye on each other, controlled each other, watched each other. Then in mashav, where people lived on individual farms, you know, it was hard to control people, okay? That's what we mean, that what, that's what they meant when they talked about dangers of individual farming. Uh, when I explored this topic of kibbutzim, uh, Jewish socialism in Palestine, in a manual published by one of the 
Zionist planners who planned these settlements. He was an architect named Itzhak Valkani, an architect who actually planned um, these villages, socialist villages. He published a manual in 1927 where he uttered the following phrase, and I put it in quotation marks, our national aspirations cannot be realized without a dash of socialism, unquote. A very interesting quotation. <clears throat> so we have this movement. Originally, Moshav, the Moshav model was also accepted, but then 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, it goes away because it wasn't sponsored. Sponsors didn't like this idea of Mashal. They like kibbutz, the kibbutz idea. Okay. Although it was very inefficient, everybody saw that the, this communistic labor and this agricultural settlements wasn't efficient. But since it was ethno political project of kibbutzim, it was supported. It received the major support. Okay. It was because it was needed for self defense purposes. In fact, um, one of the requirements for kibbutz settlements was to reduce the space among the houses because when you reduce the spaces space among the houses so you will be congregating together it was easy it would be easy to defend each other in in case arabs attacked you which was not the case of moshav settlements where jewish farms were separate from each other so it, it would be easy for arabs to destroy these jewish farms okay that is why uh, by the end of 1930s kibbutz as a mo as the model replaced moshav okay by 1949 we already have in israel 240 kibbutz settlements erected exactly on the borders where Arabs and Jews were interacting with each other. So they, these were frontier settle, settlements. So this is one of these uh, settlements, air, aerial view from up above. So basically what we're talking about, it's um, the whole idea of kibbutzim, it's an idea of Jewish romantic national socialism or nationalist socialism, if you feel uncomfortable to say national socialism you can say nationalist socialism it's an uh, archaic and modern at the same time see this each modern nationalism you know preach this romantic archaic of uh, archaic ideas of rural village lifestyle so going back to land and that's what uh, the socialist zionism did in palestine heroic sacrifice to give land back to the people <clears throat> heroic rebirth of jews as a nation and at the same time uh, the heroic ideal to redeem uh, the jewish nation as a socialist nation and by the way originally right now of course among the left the whole idea of uh, israel is uh, very much absent okay the whole idea of israel is criticized among the left but originally uh, in the 1930s 1940s 1950s and well into 1970s there were many progressive jews who made pilgrim pilgrimages to kibbutz they worked it was like a rite of passage for each american um jewish intellectual to go for a while to palestine to work like for a few months in a kibbutz like to kind of to redeem himself or herself and that is why if you go back to these uh, aged icons of american socialism you heard about them i picked them up just before coming to this lecture i threw a couple of pictures for you remember the names of bernie saunders or noam chomsky these were the guys who also when they were young they made this uh, quote unquote sacred pilgrimage secular pilgrimage to israel to to live for a few months in a socialist kibbutz kind of to re be reunited with the jewish socialist soil some of them had actually a bad experience because 
they were uncomfortable. Uh, like Chomsky, for instance, he was very uncomfortable because, ironically, in his memoirs, he said that I came to live in a Marxist-Leninist kibbutz, but at the same time, I was appalled by their xenophobic ideas they tried to share with me about their Arabic neighbors. So he was, <laughs> it, it created this un, um, cognitive dissonance, uncomfortable, uncomfortable feelings in his uh, socialist head. <laughs> his socialist mindset could not absorb these ideas. How these folk who preached Marxist Leninism, even, he even blamed them in being Stalinist. That's what he says in his memoirs. But at the same time, the same people preached ideas of this uh, xenophobia. They said, all oh, these uh, uh, Arabs, you know, they stayed totally away from them. So he could not digest this. He couldn't comprehend these ideas. But anyway, going back to the whole thing, the whole idea, what I wanted to say, originally in the early um, stages of uh, kibbutzim history, it was like a rite of passage for many progressive Jews to go to Palestine and to contribute their labor uh, to the socialist settlements, okay, to feel comfortable, to feel kind of, re to feel, to feel redeemed in, in their own eyes and the eyes of their friends, to kind of come back and to share the story, oh, I, I worked physically on the land, you know, <laughs> I participated in the socialist project, okay. <clears throat> Let's talk in the end. I'm finishing again my story. The fate of Kibbutzim was um, like the fate of many other socialist communes. Remember, we talked about New Harmony, Robert Owen. Unfortunately, uh, they failed. They failed. The majority of uh, the majority of Kibbutzim, they were not self-sustained communities. They were not self-efficient. They could not. Um, they could not sustain themselves. Uh, originally, they were sponsored by rich uh, philanthropists, as I said. And later, when the state of Israel was created, they were directly sponsored by the Ju by the Israeli government, Israeli government Labor Party, Labor Party, that was in power until seven, 1977. Actually, uh, issued to them the most favorable credit. They gave them money, uh, grant, direct grants, financially help, helped them. If um, uh, kibbutz was failing, government came to help this particular kibbutz. It was a standard practice to bail them out. Okay. In 1977, this paradise was over because a new political party came to power, a nationalist, a Jewish nationalist party called Likud, Likud. It was a political party that was not linked to ideas of nationalism. And they decided to purge socialism from the ideology of Israeli state. And that's how um, the socialist ideology started to decline in Israel. It was already on decline before, before 1977. I'm sorry before 1977. But now, since the government was not socialist, it started to go down. The building of the nation of Israel was complete, so there was no need <laughs> for these uh, militarized socialist settlements to protect the borders of the new Israeli state. Israeli state had now their own military army military army, professional army, so there was no need for these uh, popular militia. <clears throat> I would like to mention something at the end. By 1989, and it was really shocking news because many residents of Kibbutzim and the Israeli population in general, they didn't know about this. As it turned out, hundreds of kibbutz together owed four billion dollars to the state to the government so government bailed them out gave them new credit again bailing out giving new credit or grants direct grants financial grants and eventually they accumulated a huge debt by 1989 the overall debt was four billion dollars 
So it was clear to everybody, even to the most committed uh, idealists, that the whole idea of kibbutzim existed at the public expense. They were needed at a particular time. They were needed at a particular place in the frontiers. And now there was no need for them. Plus, they owed billions of dollars. So it, were, it took um, decades for the Israeli government to go through different monetary schemes to somehow re re redeem this <laughs> redeem this debt. To make a long story short, it was a total loss. So many kibbutzim uh, were disbanded or they started to privatize the land, the land that was uh, collectively held now was privatized the lands were distributed among the families and uh, land plots in each kibbutzim were declared the private property of a particular family why because collective labor did not bring profits and plus uh, manual labor on the land especially without machines was very inefficient but that was the goal of some of these people some of them even didn't I want to engage machines too much because they wanted to prove to themselves and to their neighbors that could work they could work on the land with the hay with a shovel uh, I'm sorry with the um, with a shovel so kibbutz experience proved that the whole idea was a child of martial age And finally, and I'm finishing my story, this the first socialist settlement that had been set up in Palestine in 1910 named Digania eventually was the last to, privatize, to be privatized. <laughs> Interesting story. The, the circle was complete, 1910, 2007. In 2007, Digania was privatized. Eventually, it resisted. The members of kibbutz resisted to the very last moment. Okay. But no matter how much like private sponsors contributed trying to prolong the existence of this socialist experiment, still the socialist labor was inefficient and eventually they gave up people who lived in Digania. Young people moved out and those aged people who were still hooked on socialist ideas, they raised up their hands and they said, yes, we need to privatize and all land was privatized. Uh, land in Digania that was public property was eventually divided in private land plots and that was that was the end Some, to summarize the whole story I would like to say that uh, compared to other socialist experiences I think it was the most benign benign from uh, compared to other socialist models because this benign idea of kibbutzim was based on volunteer labor. So now nobody forced people to join these collectives. They themselves, for ethno, for I repeat, for ethno-political reasons, were escaping from Europe and other countries to find a safe heaven in Palestine to set up socialist settlements. And again, when their major job was fulfilled, to serve, to guard the frontiers of Israeli state. They were disbanded. That was the end of this great experience of volunteer socialism. That's how I would like to label it, a volunteer socialism. Okay. Thank you for your attention.